Hello, and welcome to this CTSNet Roundtable on the role of surgery for pulmonary metastatic disease. We have some fantastic panelists here with us today who've done some very important research in this area. I'm very delighted to welcome them. My name is Mari Antonoff. I'm a thoracic surgeon at MD Anderson in Houston. I'd like to ask our panelists to each introduce themselves. My name is Erin Corsini, and I'm a clinical research fellow at MD Anderson. Hi, my name is Loretta Runse, and I'm an assistant professor at City of Hope. Hi, my name is Neil Chudgar, and I'm a cardiothoracic surgery fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I'd like to thank you all so much for coming to join us. Um, let's start with the basics. One of the issues that comes up with regard to surgical resection for pulmonary metastatic disease is the wide variability in practice patterns, with some patients being offered options for local aggressive therapy, whereas others are not. So let me start with you, Dr. Yeroon Say. Um, you've done some great work writing about preoperative evaluation and indications for pulmonary mm -hmm. metastasectomy. And I'm wondering if you can just share with us what are some of the broad general considerations when contemplating pulmonary metastasectomy for patients? Um, thank you. That's a great question. Um, we see a lot of these patients, and I, I really do try to think about four or five different criteria that I um, try to determine whether the patient passes before moving forward. So one of the first things is whether the, the primary uh, site is controlled or controllable. And so if that is controlled or controllable, I think, okay, fine, maybe the, the patient can move forward with um, metastasectomy. And then I think about um, not so much the number of METs, but whether it's possible for me to get them all, right? And so if they're all surgically resectable, um, and sometimes even in combination with my radiation oncologist, whether we can get all of them um, I, is something that I, I consider. Also, it's it, we have to make sure that the patient has enough cardiopulmonary reserve. If they don't have good uh, lung function, especially after the resection, then it's, it, there's no real point to doing that. So that's something that I also consider. And then I like to talk with my medical oncology colleagues to make sure there's no strong systemic um, option. Um, you know, the truth is many of these patients are going to recur again, and, and we know that. Um, so I, I like to just discuss whether we should be moving forward with just resection or whether we should have chemo first or some other systemic agent. Um, and so usually those are the, um, the things that I think about. That's really helpful, and I think we, we can really apply most of those comments to most of the different types of disease that we see that metastasize to the lung. But now I want to delve into some very specific tumor types. Um, let's start with you, Dr. Chudgar. You've authored several papers in the area of metastatic soft tissue sarcoma to the lungs. And can you tell us what are some of the attributes that make patients good candidates for surgery in this disease? And also, what have you learned about the efficacy of repeat pulmonary metastasectomy in patients um, in this population? Sure. Thank you for your questions, Dr. Antonoff. Um, so as we know, soft tissue uh, sarcoma has a predilection to metastasize to the lung. Um, it has a hematogenous spread, so we often see patients developing pulmonary metastases. These patients tend to be younger, and they often have pretty good cardiopulmonary reserves, so we do consider whether these should be operative candidates or not. Um, what we had studied was uh, our institution's database. Uh, we looked at over 500 patients um, that underwent metastasectomy for soft tissue sarcoma, um, and we sought to identify factors associated with outcome. Um, we found that the overall cohort undergoing metastasectomy had a median overall survival of about 33 months. And the factors that were over, uh, associated with uh, overall survival, um, they included the disease-free interval, um, the number of nodules that patients presented with, the histologic subtype with patients having uh, leiomyosarcomas doing better than those having things like uh, synovial sarcomas and pleomorphic sarcomas. Um, uh, as well as uh, patients having a minimally invasive resection, those patients did better. Um, the disease-free interval was pretty short, though, and these patients had a lot of recurrence, as was mentioned. It was just 6.8 months in the median for our cohort. There were only two factors, though, that we saw that were associated with disease-free survival, and those were number of nodules and the disease-free interval. Um, when we looked at repeat resection, we saw that 70% of our cohort actually had a pulmonary recurrence, so pretty high. Um, we compared those that underwent repeat resection to those that were not managed with an operation. Uh, and we found that selection for repeat operation, those factors uh, were the disease-free interval, the number of nodules, if they had a minimally invasive operation at the index metastasectomy, um, younger uh, age uh, as well. Um, and when we uh, compared patients that had a resection versus those that didn't, we did, when controlling for these factors, found that those that had resection uh, had a significantly better uh, overall survival. Um, I think the bottom line from both of these studies that we took um, were that there were key factors uh, important for selection, and those were primarily disease-free interval and the number of nodules. And I think these act as surrogates 
uh, for degree, disease aggressiveness and then the tumor burden that these patients present with. That's great. That's very helpful. I think we see a lot of similarities between some of these different tumor types and the ways they behave, things that we look at, like disease-free interval and number of nodules. There are some differences between some of the tumor types. So I want to talk about colorectal metastases a little bit, and I'm going to turn the attention to Dr. Corsini. Um, you've investigated fairly extensively in the area of colorectal metastases to the lung, and um, you've identified actually some pretty novel predictors of outcome for patients undergoing surgery with this disease state. First of all, before we talk about these novel predictors, I'm wondering if you can just briefly touch on some of the well-established predictors that have come out of some of the older retrospective reviews. Sure. Thanks for that question. Um, I think one of the first and most comprehensive studies that evaluated um, pulmonary metastasectomy for colorectal cancer was Dr. Blackman's paper from 2012. In that study, she evaluated the um, outcomes of about 200 patients undergoing metastasectomy for colorectal cancer and importantly identified that the disease-free interval and uh, greater than three or greater nodules uh, were associated with both survival and long recurrence. Now, some of the other prognostic factors that she identified were age greater than 60 and uh, male sex, but sex has been perhaps controversial in other literature. Um, a SEER study from uh, later years identified that female females were actually at greater risk for occurrence and poorer survival, so perhaps the verdict is still out with regards to sex. I think some other factors that are important to note are that um, I think few would disagree that intrathoracic nodal disease portends a poor prognosis, but this factor is fraught with uh, debate. Uh, not all surgeons sample the nodes, not all surgeons perform lymphadenectomy routinely, and perhaps there's some selection bias here, but I think when the um, nodes are identified to be positive, this does portend a poor prognosis. This. Absolutely. I, and I would agree that we've seen in all of these studies that there's some variability in terms of the, the specific characteristics that are being tested with the hypotheses, and some of these variables have different outcomes in different retrospective studies, but the two features that we've seen pretty consistently in colorectal and in sarcoma mm -hmm. is the disease-free interval and the number of nodules. But you've also um, done some very recent studies that identified some newer uh, predictors of outcome in patients with colorectal um, metastases to the lung. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about those new predictors that you've identified. Absolutely. So we published last year in the Journal of Surgical Oncology that um, a number of mutations, which are in fact the most common mutations uh, found in colorectal cancer, are actually predictive of outcomes following metastasectomy. These are KRAS, APC, and P53, and these have been previously identified to be associated with outcomes for both the primary colon disease and also hepatic metastatic disease, but have not been comprehensively studied for um, pulmonary metastases. And so we were able to show that patients with um, KRAS mutations mutations and also P53 mutations had poor survival and also had earlier lung recurrence following metastasectomy. And interestingly, those with wild type APC were found to um, experience prolonged survival and um, freedom from lung recurrence. And then in, uh, another area of investigation of ours has been the laterality of the primary colon cancer, that is, um, whether the tumor is left-sided or arising in the sigmoid colon or descending colon or right-sided versus rectal cancers. And this has also been comprehensively studied in the colorectal literature, but really has not been uh, previously evaluated in terms of pulmonary metastatic disease. And we identified that patients with left-sided primary tumors do better following metastasectomy in comparison to rectal or uh, right-sided tumors. Thank you, that's terrific. That's a lot of really interesting work. And we've talked about a lot of these predictors of telling us someone's likelihood to have prolonged disease-free survival after having pulmonary metastasectomy. But I wanna make uh, a, a shift here and ask Dr. Irun say, a little bit of a difficult question. This is more of an ethical question. Um, we've heard from all of you these predictors of prolonged disease-free interval. And um, many of these things are things that we can't control. You know, the size of the tumor, the number of nodules, and um, the, uh, the histology um, and all of these issues, the patient's um, uh, mutational profile. And when you talk to us about the characteristics that make someone an acceptable candidate for surgery, there are the aspects that make them a, a good candidate in terms of their ability to tolerate surgery, their mm -hmm. performance status, their pulmonary function tests, um, that side of it, but then also their disease state. And I, I'm curious how you feel we should approach patients who may have several characteristics that would portend a bad prognosis, short disease-free interval, lots of nodules, bad histology, all of the things that we worry about, um, the wrong sex, although we can't figure out whether it's male or female, but all of these characteristics in a young individual with stage four disease who actually has ECOG performance status zero and great PFTs, how do you deal with that? Because we see a lot of those folks where it'll be 
a very young individual. Sometimes people in their 30s or 40s, they have young families, and they understand that their disease free interval might be very long, but they want to have every chance that they can. Yeah. I'm curious how you approach that as a in your practice, that type of ethical dilemma. Yeah. Um, again, another great question. I would say that um, these are one of the cases that I am so grateful for to awards. Um, for you know, um, it is very important I think to discuss patients like this in a multidisciplinary fashion, um, and so um, the you know I very routinely would bring this up to my medical and radiation on co uh, colleagues. But I one thing that I feel very strongly about is the need to um, be very frank with patients. I, I I like and I'd say this to my patients all the time that I want you to know what I know and we will make this decision together. And so uh, I don't have one number like when they when we talk about the number of not just I don't have one number where I say well if, you, if the number's four I'm not touching you sure. because I really do believe that it's important to to have a conversation the truth is um, um, if you let a patient know that you know what the disease free and your disease free interval is short you know what I mean like and 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 so it that suggests that we may not really be able to conquer this disease but if you're willing to undergo the risk of the procedure I'm there with you you know but at the same time I think um, it's important to allow them to have the information allow them to have part of the say so yeah. even as you discuss within a multidisciplinary fashion I do believe that there are extremes right and so if you come if you have a patient who comes in and they have two numerous account nodules or if uh, they've, we've, we didn't mention this before, but exothoracic metastases, I think there's some things where you just say, you know what, that's not, this is not the right answer, and I can only do harm to you. Um, I think though that that's an easier conversation, but when we have more of the grayer in the middle, um, I really do, I lean hard, uh, um, strongly on my tumor board and, and discussing with the patient and seeing where they lean. Well, that's terrific. I, I agree. They can be such challenging conversations, yeah. and sometimes you just have to get a sense from the family Absolutely. and a sense from the oncologist. Absolutely. And even what the patient's journey has been up to that point, because right. some of them are exhausted from chemotherapy, that's they have right. terrible neuropathy, that's right. you know, all sorts that's of other, right. other consequences from their prolonged other therapies, and that's all right. they really want is a break that's right. from chemotherapy, that's and right. they, they're willing to take a short disease-free interval just to get off that's the right. chemo. That's right. So I, I think there's so many different things that we can consider. I want to bring up one of the uh, limitations that we have and the challenges we have in pulmonary metastatic disease, and that's really the lack of randomized controlled trials. So there, um, in terms of lung-limited colorectal cancer, the UK study was initiated and then it was stopped due to poor accrual. And we have begun at MD Anderson the um, uh, trial for uh, a prospective trial looking at lung-limited um, colorectal metastases. And that has been rolled out to numerous sites through the Thoracic Surgery Oncology Group, which is terrific, but we're certainly a very long ways away from getting data and being able to use that to make clinical decisions. So I'm, I'm curious, um, what do you see as being one of the downsides of, or many of the downsides of using so much retrospective data in this patient population? I think it's a pretty selected group of patients, and I'm just curious if you could comment on some of the challenges and limitations of the literature that we have with that regard. So I think one of the frustrations that we encountered when going through our database uh, was that it's a surgical database. Um, so we really lack the denominator. Um, it, it's nice to know the patients that are not uh, undergoing metastasectomies that are, that are selected out. So we don't really have that pool of candidates overall from which we're selecting. So uh, I think we talk about selection so heavily and it, it's, it's hard not knowing who we're selecting from ultimately. I think a point that you just alluded to is that there's great selection bias here. These patients may be the ones with um, a less aggressive disease, great biology, and a prolonged disease-free interval, so perhaps they would do just as well without metastasectomy. We just don't know, but uh, if you're willing to offer it to them and they can do well from it, I think it will continue to be offered, and something like the prospective clinical trials will really be the, the nail in the coffin to give a real answer. Dr. Rinsay, any thoughts? Um, no, I totally agree. I think uh, uh, it, it's good to be able to look at things and from observational studies or retrospectively, but I do think we need to move forward with more prospective studies. And, and I'm, even though it might take a while, I'm glad that we've started some. Um, I think we have all of the information we're going to get from the studies that we have now, <laughs> right. and yeah. we need to uh, step it up. Yeah. yeah, so in terms of stepping it up, we're talking about um, doing prospective trials. I think another area that future research may hold some promise is using molecular markers such as ctDNA to try to determine the role for adjuvant therapy after metastasectomy. And where else do you guys see the future of research in this area going? 
Well, I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, so certainly immunotherapy, targeted therapy, my goodness, I, I can't imagine that um, we won't be seeing trials or, or regimens that include um, some of these agents, even, you know, maybe, you know, um, uh, neoadjuvant before you, uh, Resecto, even after. And so I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that the, there's going to be some of that. I think one of the other areas, uh, and maybe this will be a little controversial. Do you mind if you remember English for the second year? That was funny. I was like, clown car. <laughs> and I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what did I say? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, targeted therapy. Yes. Oh, right. So, it, right. So, the, I think the future in pulmonary metastasectomy is going to include immunotherapy and targeted therapies uh, either before or after resection. So uh, this might be a little controversial, but we're hearing more and more about SBRT. Um, and a lot of these patients that we see undergo several repeated operations, oftentimes multiple thoracotomies. Um, so I think seeing if potentially there may be a role for SBRT for some of these folks um, it may be worthwhile to look into. Yeah. I think you bring up an interesting point. Now, we do have some data out of our institution that demonstrated um, much, uh, much earlier recurrence for SBRT compared to surgery for um, for colorectal metastases, even to a greater degree than what we see in, in lung cancer. It was pretty pronounced. But I also think there may be a role for hybrid approaches. So there are some patients where you see them and they might need multiple wedges on one side and the other side there's a small lesion that's really deep and you don't really know how you're going to get at it without doing some sort of anatomic resection. Mm -hmm. And it may be worthwhile in those patients to do surgery on the side that has mm -hmm. multiple tumors that are on the periphery that you can get out mm -hmm. and to do some sort of hybrid approach on the other side. Um, I, I totally um, agree with that. In fact, that is our practice. Again, we, we present these patients in a multidisciplinary fashion and literally radiation and I will go back and forth as to which nodules are going to be ours oh, that's great. that we're going to take um, control of. And so um, I think that is the future and certainly we've, we've started that. Dr. Corsini, did you have any other thoughts about where you see the research in this area going? So I think that um, some of the research that I mentioned earlier using the mutations present in the primary colon cancer could help direct some uh, targeted therapy mm -hmm. and uh, immunotherapies for diseases that have um, EGFR mutations present or other, other mutations present that we have yet to know about and have targeted therapies for. Oh, that's terrific. This has really been a fantastic conversation. I know that our time is near going to end. I just want to check if anyone has any other closing, closing thoughts related to this topic that you'd like to share. Well, thank you very much. So grateful to our wonderful panelists who are uh, fan uh, wonderful experts in this area for sharing all of their knowledge and expertise.